Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So before we begin reflection on Dua al Iftitah, let's mention a couple of uh, <clears throat> masail regarding uh, frequently asked questions regarding fasting. If someone <clears throat> did not fast for so many years, many people ask this question. He was not practicing for so many years, and now God guided him, and he started to practice Islam. He started to pray and fast. What should he or she do regarding the past years that he or she missed? <clears throat> Are they forgiven or not? He has to make them up. What do you think, the new generation? We have many new faces here. What do you think? We will put this for voting. Now, if that person, if that person was not Muslim, and then he or she embraced Islam, then all the past is forgiven. They don't have to repeat the prayers and the fasting and the zakat that they missed during the years that they were not Muslims. But if he or she were born Muslims, then they have to make up for what they have missed. How do they wake up, make up that? They make up that, there are two ways. One is that they make up the days. Let's say he missed 10 Ramadans, 20 Ramadans, 30 Ramadans. So he has to fast all these days that he missed. Plus, and this is not me, sorry. This is not me. This, these are the maraja, the scholars. He has to pay penalty, expiation, kafar. What is the penalty for every day missed with no reason? No reason meaning he was not traveling, he was not sick, or women were not during their period. If someone breaks his fast deliberately for no reason, how much penalty he or she should pay? For every day they missed, 60 days, Habibi. Enjoy it. 60 days. Now, suppose he cannot. He says, I really can't. For every day you want me to, to make up 60 days, I'm going to die. This means I have to live the rest of my life fasting. In that case, if he or she cannot afford the expiation of 60 days for every day they missed, then we come to the second penalty, which is feeding 60 poor person for every day they missed. Now the feed, what is the, the meal? It doesn't have to be a full meal. Now, what is the average price of, of a meal in a restaurant here in Irvine, Orange County? $30, $20 before pandemic. Now, $30, $40. If you, if you order with it, Master Musir, $40. <laughs> Believe me, go to any restaurant here. So feeding does not mean you take him to a restaurant. No. Feeding, it means if you give a loaf of a bread. What is the loaf of a bread today? How much is it in the market? A dollar? Two dollars? Two dollars? Maybe two dollars. So this is for 60. So 60 times two $120 per day that he missed. Now, if this is too much and they can afford, in that case, if really they cannot afford, then the expiation, the kafara, is it dropped and forgiven, and they only make one day, only one day for every day they missed. Okay? Any question on this? Any question on this? Now, if a person was sick, he had a reason. He or she could not afford to fast because of sickness. Then they only pay, as I mentioned last night, the deer. No, not the deer. Not, not the kafara. Fidya. Fidya tun ta'amu miskeen. According to the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah. Fidya tun ta'amu miskeen. Fidya is 750 grams of food and the food either barley 
or, or bread, or wheat, or rice, or dates, 750 grams for every day that they can't, they could not afford to fast. Now, a couple of other uh, issues here. One of them is inhaler. Some people have to use inhaler during the day. Does that invalidate their fast? No, it doesn't. As long as it does not reach the stomach, it reaches the lungs, then it's okay to use the inhaler. Plus, if someone needs IV, God forbid he's not feeling well, and he needs IV, but he wants to continue to fast, the doctor tells him, you may fast, but with IV, then he or she can use IV, even though the IV is nutritious. Nutritious. Gives him energy, but, uh, but don't try to cheat, huh? Don't go to the hospital and tell them, don't. The, the point about fasting is to have more patience, is really to feel the hunger, to feel the thirst. It's okay, few days of the year, we feel the hunger, we feel the thirst for a few hours, it's okay. It's okay for our soul. It's okay for our spiritual journey. It teaches a lot of things. So try to fast, inshallah, and continue your fast and the rest of the things, inshallah, uh, in the upcoming night. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. In that case, if you heard the question, <clears throat> if someone is on medication and these medications such as antibiotics, they require a lot of water. And the water that he drinks during the night is not enough. He needs to hydrate himself during the day too. In that case, he must break his fast. If medication are necessary and the water is necessary, then definitely that person is exempted from fasting. So after Ramadan, if he's okay, he will make up. If not, if after Ramadan, until the next Ramadan, he is not okay, then he will make it up and then if he could not fast until next Ramadan, he will pay also kafara, which is 750 gram of, uh, of food. For those who do hard work and they get thirsty during the day, such as bakery. I remember nowadays, I don't know about bakeries, but in the old days, the baker, he had to stop to stand at the oven, directly at the oven, his face, his body, his arms, they were almost touching the fire. And that person during the, 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 the summer season, long days, he could not, he really could not sustain thirst. So those people who their livelihood depends on their work, they cannot afford to take off. Some people cannot afford to take off the month of Ramadan. Not even a week, not even a day, not even a day. That person is exempted from fasting. That person can skip the fasting during Ramadan and he can make it up later on. And someone who gets hungry, unusual, he, he needs to eat. And if he does not eat, he cannot go to work. And if he cannot go to work, he cannot support his family. That person too. If he cannot support his family financially because he is not going to work, that person also is exempted from fasting during Ramadan. He may choose another season when the days are shorter or when he is not working and he would make up. Okay? Any other question? Yes, Agha Mahmoud? For one day? If you leave in the afternoon, if you live in Orange County, and you leave Orange County in the afternoon, you go to San Diego, and you sleep there, let's say, you spend the night in San Diego, the following day, you are coming back to Orange County, you don't make the intention of fasting, but you don't eat, you don't drink, 
And if you get here to Orange County before noon, then you make the intention of fasting and you can fast the following day. So you can fast the day you left as long as you, you leave after the Adhan, after 1 p.m. And the following day, if you reach here before the Adhan, you can also continue and maintain your fast. No, if you leave in the morning, you cannot maintain your fast. You have to leave in the afternoon. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala anbiya illahi jami'an. Wa ala sayyidihim wa khatamihim. Habib ilahi al-alameen. Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سيما إمامنا وقائدنا ومولانا الحجة بن الحسن المهدي المنتظر عجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأيقنت أنك أنت أرحم الراحمين في موضع العفو والرحمة وأشد المعاقبين في موضع النكال والنقمة these are verses of Dua ul iftitah narrated by our Imam, the 12th Imam, and passed through one of his, Uthman ibn Sa'id al Amri, one of his ambassadors, to the community of Ahlul Bayt, to the followers of Ahlul Bayt. And it is recommended that we recite this dua if we can every night, if we cannot every other night, if not once a week and reflect on this dua. And this is what we are doing now. We are reflecting. My friends, the life of a believer should swing between two things. Between two things. According to this dua and according to the Quran. God says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21st, when he speaks about Anbiya, the community of the messengers and the prophets and the apostles, and he mentions 25 of them in chapter 21. 25, he mentions them by name. He says, When they pray, when they supplicate, when they ask, when they connect with us, they swing between two things. Raghaban, hope. They have hope in my mercy. They have hope. They know I'm merciful. But also at the same time, not only hope, Rahaba, they have fear too. Hope and fear. This is how our life should be. Mu'min believes, Mu'min lives between al khawfu wal raja. Fear on the one hand that maybe God is not going, I should not take him for granted. And also hope that he is. The most merciful because if we only speak about God's forgiveness and mercy and love some people are going to take advantage of that trust me some people take God for granted they say since he's love 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 and you know this is happening in the Christian tradition because they focus all their focus 100% God loves you God loves you no matter what you do God loves you God loves you God loves you this is why they do everything throughout the week. And they think that going to the church, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour on Sunday is going to wash away everything they did. This is not right. God loves you as long as you respect God. You respect rules and regulations. Because most people, they have this nature in them, embedded, embedded in them. What is it? Rebellious. Rebellious. They want to be above the law. All people, not only in the Middle East, even in this country, even in America. Most people do not respect the law. Imagine if the authorities, they remove the speed signs from the freeways. Would people stick to 65 or 70 or 75 or 80? They don't. In Germany, I don't know how, how many of you have driven on German highways. I've done that. I speed myself, I admit. I'm not doing something good, but this is, alhamdulillah, Allah is protecting so far. 
I was there, I was surprised that I'm a speeding person, but the cars, when they pass, you know, they pass me, psh, 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 160, and without exaggeration, kilometers, of course, kilometers, 160, 180, 200, because there is no speed limit, no speed limit. When there is no law, people are not going to say, well, I have to drive to drive safe. I have to respect others' lives. They don't, they don't say that. Of course, in the cities, in Germany, in the cities, when you approach the city, they start to put the speeding signs. 120, 180, 60, some areas 40. And amazingly, the drivers, they stick to that speed limit. 40. Why? Because there are cameras. Here there is law. The law is enforced here in this area. So you have to respect the law. This is our nature. Nobody would come and say, but I have conscience, you know, I have faith, I have respect for others. No. So God had tilka hududullah. God has to set the rules and regulations to protect us. If we break them, we are liable for what? Retribution. This is what the Imams say. Imam alayhi salam says, وَأَيْقَنْتُ I am certain, I know for certain, أَنَّكَ أَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ That you are the most merciful of the mercifuls. Where? فِي مَوْضِعِ الْعَفْوِ وَالرَّحْمَةِ In dispositions of forgiveness and mercy. But at the same time, وَأَشَدُّ الْمُعَاقِبِينَ The most severe, the most, the very severe too, at the time of retribution and discipline. وَأَشَدُّ الْمُعَاقِبِينَ فِي مَوْضَعِ النَّكَالِ وَالنَّقِمَ So people do not take advantage of you. They know God is serious. God is serious here. So the Imam uses the term أَيْقَنْتُ أَيْقَنْت comes from Yaqeen. What is Yaqeen? Yaqeen is mentioned in the Quran too. Scholars, ethicists, ulama al-akhlaq, scholars of ethics, say that the highest level of faith and commitment is yaqeen, a certainty. And yaqeen is different than ilm. We have something called yaqeen, certainty. And we have something else called ilm, and they are different. Yaqeen is bigger than ilm. They say yaqeen is when you have doubt about something, you research, you study, and then you find the answer. Once you find the answer, you reach the stage of yaqeen, certainty. Because you did your homework. You had ilm about it, knowledge, but you were not certain. But when you started to research more, and then you found the answer, the right answer, then you reach a state of yaqeen, certainty. So every yaqeen is ilm. Every certainty is knowledge, but not every knowledge is certainty. Not even every knowledge we have is absolutely correct. Sometimes we have knowledge, ilm, but it's not correct. We think it's correct, but it's not correct. And this daraja of yaqeen, this level of yaqeen is possessed by whom? By the anbiya, the prophets, and the imams. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Wallah, لو كشف لي الغطاء. Friends, there is a curtain now covering our eyes. We think we we have sharp eyes, but our eyes are limited. But the prophets, the imams, were able to see beyond. Have you seen the X-ray? The X-ray it sees beyond what is inside your guts, your body. They had an X-ray vision. Very sharp vision. Imam Ali says, even if this curtain is removed, and this is, the removal of the curtain is mentioned in this book, in the Quran. God says, now your eyes are covered. You don't see the truth. You don't see the angels. You don't see the heaven. You don't see the hell. You don't see what is beyond this limited and small earth. You don't see. But once you die, you're going to see. فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ بَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ Iron vision. At, time, at, at the time of death, when this body, when this soul is released from this cage, this cage is called body. 
It's a cage. The soul is incarcerated, trapped inside this cage. When it is released by death, فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ hadid. Your vision becomes an iron vision. Imam Ali says, I can see I have iron vision now before I die. Even now. I reached a stage in my certainty, in my belief, in my trust in God, in my faith in God, that even before death I can see. I can see the heaven, I can see the sirat, I can see the bridge, I can see the hellfire, I can see everything. And God in chapter 6, Surah Al-An'am says, وَكَذَلِكَ and hence, وَكَذَلِكَ نُرِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلِيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُوقِنِينَ And hence, we enable Ibrahim to see the dominion of the heaven and the earth. So he becomes one of those who possess certainty. مِنَ الْمُوقِنِينَ Only few people can reach that level of yaqeen. Only few people. Requires a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of depriva deprivation. When we cannot deprive ourselves or self denial, we don't have self denial. You know, we don't have. This is one of the things we learn in Ramadan self denial and self control. If only we can control ourselves, that's it, no need for any other thing. If we can control our desires, we, we pass A plus. No doubt about it. But our weakness does not allow us to enjoy this self-denial, self-control. But the imams, the prophets, imagine Yusuf alayhi salam, young, energetic, the most handsome in his city, in his kingdom, is chased by a rich lady, powerful lady, influential lady, beautiful lady, in a place Huge palace, empty. And she's chasing him and he runs away. Who can have this, this, this resistance, power of resistance? It's not. It's not easy. It's not, we read it in the book. We read it. But when it comes to practice, most of us, we lose. We slip. We slip. Those people who can resist, they reach the stage of certainty. Yaqeen. وَلْيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُقِنِينَ So Imam is saying, God, I know with certainty. وَأَيْقَنْتُ أَيْقَنْتُ past tense. فَعِلْ مَاضِي in Arabic, past tense. It means not just today. From the beginning of my creation, from my eternal journey into this life, I have certainty that you are. وَأَيْقَنْتُ أَنَّكَ أَنْتَ He uses for assertion and ta'keed, he uses two terms. Annaka, pronoun, but a pronoun which is disconnected. Dhamirun munfasil. Anta, another pronoun which is muttasil, attached, connected. So he uses two pronouns. One of them is munfasil, the other is muttasil. One of them is disconnected, the other is connected. For extra assertion and confirmation. An affirmation. I have no doubt, no doubt, not even one in a zillion, that you are the most merciful of the mercifuls. Can we reach this stage and put our trust in God and understand God in this context that He is the most merciful of the mercifuls, more than your mother? How much your mother loves you? God created mercy. This is a metaphor. The hadith says it. A met metaphor. In 100 portions. He sent only one portion down to earth from the beginning of this life till the end of this life. So people use that portion to practice mercy among themselves. The mercy that a mother has is amazing. Is amazing. No human being has that level of compassion and mercy like your mother. Otherwise, you don't get to this stage. I know sometimes we do injustice to our mothers. We yell at them. We disrespect them. But this is the month where we go back to our senses. 
and respect our parents and get close to them. And stop. If we are abusing them, disobeying them, neglecting them, abandoning them, we have to stop. Otherwise, we don't get God's mercy. We don't get it. So one portion is sent to this earth. 99 portions are reserved for him. He left it for him. He saved these 99. So he bestows them, this mercy, this, these 99 portions, on mankind on the day of judgment. Can you imagine how much mercy he has? The hadith says God is going to be. So forgiving and so merciful that even Iblis, when he says God is forgiving this and this and this and this and that, he comes, he says, then where is my portion? Are you going to forgive me too? Iblis. Hatta inna Iblis He has hope. Can you imagine Iblis, the most wicked, Satan? He says, maybe God is going to forgive me because... Because look at those people that he forgave. So don't give up on God's mercy. But we have to be qualified for it during this month. This is the month of mercy. Shahrul Rahmah. Reach out to God. Spend some time, some minutes. Stand in the middle of the night. Don't spend your time just on, on Netflix and movies and chatting and this and that and social media. Spend some time with God, few minutes with God, few minutes during this month. Tell him, I need your mercy. I cannot survive without your mercy. And then, Arhamur Rahimin. This term, the most merciful of the mercifuls, is mentioned in the Quran four times, in four chapters. The first time is mentioned in chapter Surah Al A'raf. Wa fi rahmatika wa anta Arhamur Rahimin. When Moses and Aaron, there was a commotion in the Israeli community. Moses said to his brother Aaron, Please Aaron, you stay with the community. I go and speak to God and then I'll come back. Aaron said to him, how long are you going to be absent? He said, one month. He said, okay, one month is okay. So Moses went to speak with the Lord at the top of the mountain to ask Lord's guidance and mercy for his community. But God wanted to test the Israelites. When the month expired, Moses was about to come back. God said to him, no, 10 more days. You have to extend your stay. Of course, God could have told him this in the beginning. He could have told him. God knew that he's going to keep him 40 days. God did not change his mind. He doesn't change his mind. But he did not tell him in the beginning. So when Moses tells his community, he will say 30 days to test their resolve and their patience. Many of them failed. So when there was a delay, the community, they said to Aaron, you're a brother, run away. He's a fugitive. He's not going to come back. See, he said 30 days, he's not back. So they rebelled. And they almost killed Aaron. He was almost killed by them. There was a revolt against him. There was a commotion. And they started worshipping the calf. So when Moses came back, he looked at the community. Wow, the community is in disorder, disarray. You know, they slipped into two, they, they split into two groups. Some of them are worshipping the calf, the ajl. So he came with anger and frustration to his brother, reprimanding him. The brother said, don't reprimand me. Look at the community. They almost killed me. Here, one anger and Moses, in his nature, he was angry, by the way. If you follow his stories in the Quran, he was angry, an angry person. So when the anger subsided, he said, Oh God, forgive me and my brothers, 
وأدخلنا برحمتك في رحمتك وأنت أرحم الراحمين وأدخلنا في رحمتك وأنت أرحم الراحمين This is one time أرحم الراحمين is mentioned in the Quran The second time in Surah Yusuf When the brothers came to the father and they said the king of Egypt which is Joseph his son He's not going to give us enough food until we bring our brother Joseph with us. Uh, Binyamin, sorry. So he said, you may take Binyamin with you. But he was distressed. He said, فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِمِينَ By the way, when you leave the house, when your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father leaves the house, read this verse. Read this verse for them. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِمِينَ The third time it is mentioned in the Quran, when they came to Joseph and they said, we apologize to you for attempting to murder you, to kill you, his answer again was, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. No <clears throat> reproach I have against you. Look at his, his beauty. When the heart is beautiful, people who tried to murder him, murdered him. Serious murder attempt. He says, I have no reproach against you. I have no grudge. You made a mistake. I am willing to forgive you. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم وهو أرحم الراحمين God is going to forgive you and he is the most merciful of the mercifuls. And the fourth time is mentioned in the Quran regarding Prophet Job, Ayyub. وأيوب, he went through extreme hardships. And afflictions. And this is what he said to God. He said, وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهِ He called upon his Lord, رَبِّ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الظُّرْ Truly affliction has touched me. All sorts of afflictions. Poverty, sickness, losing his sons, losing his daughters, losing his health, losing his property, everything. He lost, literally he lost everything. One thing he didn't lose, and you should not lose it too, his faith and a trust in God. It's a test. Life is a test. So if you lose your car, your job, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife, you should not get frustrated. Sometimes God will replace you with something better. This is in chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah. مَا ننسخ من آية أو ننسها Sometimes we abrogate something, we take it away. That thing could be physical, material, it could be moral, it could be spiritual, it could be a friend, it could be money. When we take it away, if you have faith in God, we're going to replace you with something either equal or better. Alam ta'lam anna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Life is test. When God gives us his testing, when he takes away, it's another test. You have to be successful. When you lose your money, when you lose your house, when you lose your business, even when you lose your health, say, Alhamdulillah, he knows better. He knows. He's testing me. And I have to prove that I am loyal to him. I'm not going to turn my back to him. Stay loyal. So these four occasions in the Quran, God uses the term, Fallah. وَهْوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ He's the most merciful of the mercifuls. Now, how do we get God's mercy? Because Imam, Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam says, وَأَيْقَنْتُ أَنَّكَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ You are the most merciful of the mercifuls. فِي مَوْضَعِ الْعَفْوِ وَالرَّحْمَةِ In places where I deserve the mercy, how do I make myself deserve mercy? Not all people deserve mercy. And some people they do deserve. How is it? Listen to the hadith. The hadith, Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam says, Ayyama mu'minin. Do you want to deserve God's mercy? To be given God's mercy? He says, Ayyama mu'minin nafasa an mu'minin kurbatan nafasallahu anhu sab'ina kurbatan min kurabid dunya wal akhir. If you see a friend of you in the community, family member, 
cousin, friend, neighbor, someone that you don't know. But he is distressed. He needs really help. He needs someone to support him, someone to empower him, someone to stand with him, someone to hold his hand, someone to give him some money at the time of need, someone to go with him to the doctor's office, to the surgery room, to the attorney, to the court. And that person is in a state of affliction and distress. And you say, listen, I will be with you. Tomorrow, you'll find me there. Don't worry. Go on, go on and sleep in peace. I'm your brother. I'm your friend. I'm not going to let you alone. This is bringing him relief, peace of mind. You know, sometimes, my friends, we can bring peace of mind to so many people with our words. You don't have to put your hand in your pocket and take money. No, you don't have to do anything. Your statements, when you say something beautiful to that person, you empower them. Amazing this tongue, what you can do with your mouth, with your words. This is what God says to Bani Israel and, and, and to them, to, to us through them too. The Quran is not just for Bani Israel. If, if, if God criticizes them, he's criticizing us too. A message, indirect message to the Muslims. When you speak, speak nice and humble. Because when you are nice and humble, you are empowering people and inspiring them. It has an amazing effect. Even if you write a small text message, small, you send it to a friend and inspire him. He's sad, he's confused, he's alone. And you send him small messages of empowerment. This is tenfisul kurab. Relieving him or her from distress. You deserve God's mercy. At the same time, God is very severe in his retribution. Now, some people say, if God is so loving, so caring, how come he, how come he punishes people? I can't understand God to be a punishing God, angry God. My friends, Ulama al-Akhlaq, ethicists, argue that it is the sins, because God says in his book, وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ I don't wrong anyone. وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ This is a self-inflicted wound. How is that? They say when we commit a violation, a sin, this same sin, the same sin that you don't see today, you committed, Tomorrow is going to turn into a punishment. The same sin is switched into a punishment and retribution. God says in this book, Those who devour the money of the orphans, they come, at that time, orphans, they had no parents, no guardians, no state to take care of them. So their wealth, their money, their home goes to the next of kin, to a cousin, to an uncle, to someone. And that person sometimes devours their wealth. He takes the money because they are kids. They don't understand. So he takes the money away from them. He doesn't give it to them. God says that money that you are taking away from those orphans, the same money, the same coins, these dinars and dirhams and dollars and euros, these are going to turn into fire into their stomach on the day of judgment. <inaudible> they think that they are devouring currency and money, but this money is turning into fire on the day of judgment. This is the retribution. So don't blame it on God. God created laws. You studied physics, huh? What is the third, third law of motion introduced by Newton 500 years ago? Hmm? Say it loud. Every force has an equal but opposite force. It's a law. This is a law. This is a law. Created by God, discovered by scientists. So 
you have to understand the law and the repercussions. Don't blame it on God. God has no grudge, no retaliation. God wants you to be successful and happy. But when you push the wrong button, this is what happens. This is what happens. وَأَشَدُّ الْمُعَاقِبِينَ فِي مَوْضِعِ النَّكَالِ وَالنَّقِمَ Let me, and God says in the Quran, God, severe in penalty, شديد العقاب. Now, an example, and I conclude. An example of someone who deserves retribution. Listen to what Imam al-Sadiq says. Listen to what our Imam says. He says, مَنْ وَلِيَ شَيْئًا مِنْ أُمُورِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Whoever becomes a mayor, a president, a prime minister of a country who is in charge of the affairs of the ummah, the community, the country, the nation, and فَضَيَّعَهُمْ فَضَيَّعَهُمْ he does injustice to his nation. He, he destroys their lives. He was in charge of 330 million. And he's selfish. He puts himself above the nation. He destroys his nation. He doesn't care. Even if there is civil war, people are killing each other, there is a bloodshed as long as he's in office. We see this in America. We see it in every country. In every country. Corruption. That person does not respect the nation, does not respect the people. He is in charge of their affairs, but he puts himself. He's selfish, narcissistic. He puts his, himself, his own interest, before the nation. That person deserves this type of retribution. God is not going to have mercy on him. God says in his book, if you destroy the life of one individual... One individual. You destroy and disrupt his or her life. And justly, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to forgive you. If God forbids, you murder an innocent person. وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا On purpose. On purpose. For no reason. On purpose. فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ God bestows his anger on him and wrath on him and curses him and there is severe punishment if he if you destroy the life of one individual now if someone destroys the lives of an entire nation nation is starving nation is in hardship okay many of them are committing suicide when when we have a tyrant what will happen to the society you know, as a result of that, when you have a tyrant in a, in a country, it affects people's social life. It, it, it also affects marital life. People are going to get divorced. When the conditions are not good, economic conditions, there are no jobs, there is no income, there is inflation, people are going to get divorced. So who is responsible for that? This tyrant. We cannot expect God to have mercy on, on such people. So those people, they deserve the punishment and the retribution. Allahumma khfir al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat wal-muslimina wal-muslimat al-ahyai minhum wal-amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil-khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'awat innaka ghafiru al-khati'at innaka mahi al-sayyat wa ja'iluha hasanat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir tomorrow inshallah Sunday Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday we don't have iftar so inshallah you, you enjoy the iftar with your families and friends and we begin at 8 30. we don't have material food but we have spiritual food inshallah so don't miss this spiritual salad and food and come here we begin the dua al at 8 30 and the speech at 9 p.m inshallah Again, after that, Thursdays and, and Fridays and Saturdays, we have iftar. We begin with the adhan, inshallah. And if you'd like to donate for the iftar, please speak with Hajj Samir Amiri. Allahumma khfir al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat wa'ajjil fi faraj sayyidina wa maulana sahib al-asri wa zaman Since this is the month of Ramadan and we are close to the nights of Qadr, and this month and the nights of Qadr, they also belong to our Imam, Imam al-Mahdi. Let's stand and recite this dua al faraj Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kulli waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaih fi hadihi al-sa'ah wa fi kulli sa'ah. Waliyan wa hafidha 
وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا واجعلنا اللهم من أنصاره وأعوانه وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والشهداء ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد